All right, everybody. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, if you want to uh, follow along, I have my slides on my taco blog, taco.ist. Um, it's the first blog on there. And there's also a few useful links in there that I'll talk about. Uh, so my name's Chris. I work in Kansas City. If you want to follow me on Twitter or anywhere else, it's redbrick1 is my tag. And uh, let's get started. So uh, today we'll be talking about preprocess functions, what they do, how to use them, and some helpful things to just make your life easier, uh, which is always nice. We like that, don't we? Uh, you guys having a good time so far at the camp? Everybody awake, get your coffee, breakfast tacos. All right. Yeah, I see a couple people eating them as I speak. <laughs> right. So uh, first I want to uh, go ahead and let you guys know I've updated my privacy policy. So just, I got I to gotta put that out there before we start. All right, so uh, what are preprocess functions? Uh, modules and core and contrib create and serve up data that will be rendered on the page. They set up variables uh, to be placed in a template. Most of, uh, most of the things you use in Drupal will already be built to use those, have variables, display uh, content, and have all of those already set up. But if you do need to change how that content is rendered, what information is served up to the page, or uh, just add some good old custom logic before it hits the page, preprocess functions are what you're looking for. The main role of preprocessors is to set up variables to be used in a template before it hits the page, before it's themed. Uh, these variables can contain complex renderable arrays, or at its simplest, just Boolean values. Most of the logic, uh, let's see, most of the logic should be kept in the preprocessors just to keep the template files clean. Uh, that way you're not navigating through thousands of lines of code just trying to print your content. And uh, of course, also, logic in PHP is a lot easier to do in Twig, unless you're a Twig five-star certified developer. Uh, so first things first, uh, you should turn on debugging on your site, your local site. If you want to throw it up on your production site, that's up to you. I wouldn't recommend it. Uh, debugging is essential for pre-processing elements on your site. Um, so wh where this will be located, on your site, under sites default services.yaml, uh, you'll see this bit of code in there. Under twig.config, you will change debug from false to true. And uh, after you do that, clear your cache, and you'll begin to see uh, templating suggestions, theme hooks, in the comments throughout the HTML of your site. This uh, shows you, basically it just helps out a lot. I use it all the time. It's very helpful. What that looks like, uh, let's say you have your main content here. This is just uh, in the Chrome debugger tool. And it prints out these comments here. So what we have here is the region theme hook. And uh, so this displays what theme hook they're using. That's the hook you would use to modify it in the preprocess function. And uh, you can see the template naming suggestions. The one with the X region HTML twig is currently the one we're using on that page. And so if you wanted to uh, choose a different one that shows you what to do, or you can, uh, as I'll show later, you can modify these to make add more suggestions, more specific suggestions for certain pages, etc. Here's another example for uh, rendering a block on a page. The theme hook is block, and uh, for this specific one, I'm doing a search page, an exposed filter, so you can see how uh, just how specific these can get, and. Last one I have is block page title. Uh, again, the theme hook is just block. And there are your templating suggestions. And my favorite part about this is it just tells you exactly uh, uh, this is being output from this template. So you can go in your code, find out where it's wrong, and fix it. So that's very helpful. 
And uh, just uh, a heads up, in this talk, I'm talking mainly Drupal 8. They're very similar pre-processing, Drupal 7, Drupal 8. But the difference is uh, there is no template.php. That's not a thing. Now uh, we have the theme name dot theme in your theme directory rather than the template PHP. And we want to, as I said earlier, try to keep the logic in the theme file and out of the templates. It's just good business. Let's see. So next, preprocess function format. Uh, did I explain what preprocess functions do? Well, uh, they before it gets to the page, it renders the things, and you can change things before you need before it's served up on the page, basically. So preprocess functions follow this format: function, theme name, preprocess, hook, variables. And the hook is uh, what I showed earlier: the hook theme or the theme hook. So block, region, BEF filters, etc. Uh, preprocess you can preprocess basic things like nodes, paid pages, and those uh, those functions already exist. They're just theme preprocess node, theme preprocess page, HTML. Um, but if you do want to be more specific, you can use those uh, theme hooks to specifically say theme name preprocess block expose filter block. You can get really specific, as I'll show later on. Let's see. Yeah, so in the Twig debug, you can look for that theme hook just to, really, you can use a preprocess function on any element. You can do it on fields, views, basically whatever you need in the toolbox. So, for instance, if we wanted to preprocess a radio button exposed filter, uh, in this example, I'm using the better exposed filters <coughs> module. Um, so, we would find the theme hook which is in here in the theme debug, it's BEF underscore radios. And so the, the function would be function theme name preprocess BEF radios, and that will spit out all of the variables and everything you have available to you for that uh, element on the page. So um, a couple tools to view these variables. There is devil, the devil module. It uh, exposes a method called kint. And uh, there's KSM, which is similar to DPM. There are a few, I think DSM is another one. And then my favorite is Xdebug. Uh, it's just very helpful. You don't, once you have it set up, it's very easy to use. So the devil module functions, we have Kent, KSM. Uh, you throw that inside your preprocess function, then you throw whatever variable you want to expose and view into that function clear your cache, navigate to the page, and profit because it'll show you everything you need just right there on the page. Here's an example of that, what that would look like. So it spits out uh, a box on the top of your page and you have elements, attributes, title attributes, content attributes. Um, in the elements, that's the actual elements that are rendered in that theme hook. Um, there's a lot in here. I think I the next slide goes inside the elements. So clicking on that expands, you can see you have your node, all of your fields and methods that are attached to that node. Uh, your pre-render attached, you can add JavaScript CSS to this. Um, your title, and then you have down at the bottom, there's the field section, field sidebar. Those are different fields that are on the node that we're viewing. What'd you say your favorite was? Uh, Xdebug. And I'll show that next. Speaking of Xdebug. Uh, so Xdebug might be a little complicated setup. I have in my next slide uh, a link to a blog on how to do that very well. Um, so in Xdebug, you go inside the preprocess function and you add a breakpoint on a line of code, clear your cache, and when you run Xdebug, you go to that page and it'll spit out all of the variables. Basically in the same way, but it will be in your uh, your IDE or whatever you're using. I use uh, PHP Storm in that uh, it just has it right there in the box. I think, I'm not sure, you might have to install a plugin, but that is in the blog that I have right here. So it's not that crazy, although it does seem like that when you first go to set up Xdebug. 
I know I was a little bit scared when I first stepped in the door. Um, so again, if you want to view these slides and get the links on these pages, taco.ist is my site. And, uh, or the link is here, joshfabian.com slash blog slash xdebug. And that will explain how to set that up. I believe uh, it shows how to set it up in PHP Storm with Composer and a few other options. <coughs> and you won't have to look like that anymore. It's worth it. Mm -hmm. I promise. Yes. Is everybody good to move on? Next slide. Awesome. So, uh, I guess I'll step into some examples on what you can do with preprocess functions, variables. <coughs> you can, uh, one of the, like, the most basic things that you may use a lot is adding classes to an element or a wrapper, some sort of thing on the page, if you will. Um, so you would add or modify classes inside variables, classes array, and I believe, yes, I do have an example here. So this is uh, my theme preprocess HTML function. And I am <coughs> saying if the variables element user is uh, set, then we know that the user is logged in. So we grab that user, yeah. get the ID, load that user, and then from that I can then get the role off of the user and then if administrator is in the array of roles, add a new thing to the classes array of administrator, and that will go in the HTML as a class on the body tag, which is very handy if you're trying to do specific styles just for different roles on your site. And uh, you can do that really for anything. You can, uh, you can do this for uh, what page you're on, grab the URL, do like section dash about dash blog, add those classes to the body. Now, uh, if we wanted to add exposed filter titles to a wrapper, uh, for instance, for this specific use case, what I had to do, um, we had a bunch of exposed filters on a view, and we wanted to group them specifically and style them, but they were all wrapped with uh, form items was the class. So you have 10 exposed filters all wrapped in a class of form items. That's not very helpful. So um, those elements, the hook theme was a details element, how they were rendered on the page. So I ran function my theme preprocess details. Then uh, navigating through xdebug or can't I found through variables element type, uh, you can find the type of exposed filter that is there. So I said, if it's a radio button or a checkbox, only run this code. Um, just be careful not to do things globally that could break other pages. A lot of things with preprocess functions, you don't want to be specific where this code should run. Uh, so from that, I grabbed the title off of variables title, uh, lower case, that title, and then I used uh, preg replace which is, uh, I believe, just a PHP function. You can uh, strip different characters out of a string. So I stripped uh, any spaces, or yeah, stripped the title of dashes and made lowercase to add to the classes. And then I simply added that title name to variables, attributes, class, added it on to that string. Um, so now on that page, instead of just form-radios, you have form-radios search form dash radios about and it's a lot more easy to uh, for your front end developers to then access those things um, actually it was a front end developer that needed me to do this so he's uh he kept asking me lots of things he's like oh can you add this class around here can you can you add a div and then another div uh, front end we love it I do like to stay in the back end a lot, though. Kind of just stay in my corner, you know? <clears throat> All right, so next example. Uh, if we wanted to pre-process a field, let's see. This one's a little more complicated, what I did here. 
Um, so the blog taxonomy links, on this site what I had to do is I had a field taxonomy reference and I printed those on the page. So you could click on those and go to like a blog with that category. However, uh, the link on the page took me to the taxonomy term page rather than the blog page. So uh, what I did, which might not have been the drupal -y way to do it, maybe it is, um, I basically just pre-processed those fields and changed the link on those to be slash blog slash whatever the title is. Um, so we'll step through this. Uh, we have if variables field name equals field blog tags. So only for this specific blog tag or blog field throughout the whole site. Uh, I created a tags array, which is just variables items. So that's all of the links in the that are printed on the page. And then I created just uh, placeholder variables blog term name equals array. And that's going to be in the variables on the page now, there is now this new key in the variables called blog term name. So I for each over the tag arrays, for those who don't know what that is, you just loop over every single item individually and do this action on each single one. So I created a variable called blog term name and blog term link because you have to grab the name and translate it into like Chris dash right, so it would be in a URL. Um, so blog term name, tags array, there's the key number, content, title. Great, we have that. Blog term link, I lowercase the string of the, um, the title, and then I replaced any spaces with preg replace and replaced them with a dash, so it would work better in a URL. And then, uh, so in variables blog term name, that array I created earlier, I set the key. So this will run for every single one and create um, however many values in that, that this loops through the array. And I created a, a link attribute, which, uh, which is the blog term link uh, URL, and then a title, which is actually just the original title. So I have those separated and I do not have what that looks like, but what I ended up doing in Twig is I created, say, like an A tag, and I threw, I threw blog term name link, I think I did a for each over that, threw the link inside the ref of the A tag, and then threw the title inside the A tag. And so that created all of those links with slash blog slash whatever page it is. So instead of going to the taxonomy term, I now have all my links going to those blog pages. Another uh, basic level thing that you can do is uh, add JavaScript or CSS to a block or uh, whatever theme you are doing. Uh, so in this instance, I'm adding JavaScript library slick slider to my block. And so slick slider is just a carousel. And instead of including slick slider on the whole site on every single page, this is only going to run when a block is rendered on the page. And in this instance, you would probably want to be more specific. Like if you're on pre-processed block inside carousel block, run this JavaScript instead of running on every single block on the page. So now we'll talk about renderable arrays or render arrays. Uh, they're better to use than just writing. So renderable arrays, uh, you create an array and it has content, HTML, attributes, titles in there. And in the render array, you can then call that array in Twig and that'll print all of that HTML and that data on the page. And you may be wondering why wouldn't you just write HTML and the reason is, with pre-processing, you can actually hook into a render array and modify data without completely rewriting the HTML all of the way. And so that's very handy. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, creating them, how to call them in Twig, why you should use them. It's really, it comes down to writing reusable code. Because if you just write a block that has HTML, and print it on a page. Or if, if you do that for your site, that might be fine. 
But if you're trying to contribute to code, uh, contribute modules, you're doing this for a site for another company who may change it along the line. Uh, HTML is, they'll have to go in and just hard code things. These are nice because someone can go in later with a function pre-process and change the data that's on the page. So here is a basic render array. So I have created uh, variables, content, user info is my array. <coughs> and inside content, I believe I have a slide somewhere. So variables content is what's going to print on the page in Twig. So if you've used Twig, you know that you say in the brackets content dot field name or just content. So inside this, I'm adding a new key under content called user info that you could then call in Twig. So for this, I've set the type of this render array to HTML tag. There's a Drupal, there's a page on Drupal.org that shows you every single type that you can put in here for different form elements, page elements, HTML tags. Um, it doesn't just have to be an HTML tag. It's what I use for this example. The uh, specific tag I'm using in this render array is a div and you can add attributes other than class, but for this instance, I've added these three classes to this render array. User info wrapper, small 12, columns, whatever you really want to add that will help your team um, just be easier and navigate things better. And as I said earlier about uh, reusable code, since this is a render array, if someone wanted to change say a class on this later, they can just go in PHP and change the attributes class and that will change uh, what classes show up rather than having to change the HTML on a page. So that makes it just more streamlined. Yes? I, can, I think that's a really, we do a lot of things in Drupal that add complexity and people mm -hmm. might look at this from an outsider's perspective and go, why the hell do I have to render an HTML tag with a bunch of arrays? Mm -hmm. but that's a really important point, I think, that that it allows, if you do this in a module and it allows somebody at a theme layer or at a, at a lower uh, inherited theme layer mm -hmm. to manipulate this without doing any string manipulation, which is yeah. the problem this was meant to solve. Right. That's a, you look at this and you're like, this is just way over complicated for mm -hmm. you. Know, people will bail on it. Yeah. That's a really problem. Yeah, that's good. No, yeah, it's, uh, I mean, if, if you think about it, if someone wrote a module and everything that gets rendered is just an HTML file. That was Drupal 4. Yes. There we go. <laughs> Somewhat Drupal 7, the <laughs> PHP templates all the way. Um, so yeah, that's a good point. Um, so let's check the next slide. I didn't add on here, uh, you can also add inside user info, actual content. So you could call in the variables, you also have like content, field name, link, field name, body, field name, footer. Um, and you can add those inside this user info array and then uh, um, yeah, you can it, add that inside the user info array, and then that will also, instead of just adding a wrapper like I've added here, it will add those. Thank you. And you can do that when creating the render array, or you can do it here. So I've uh, added an HTML in my code. I actually had if statements, like if this field is filled out, print this field, um, just so you don't have a bunch of blank titles with blank info under them. So inside content user info, field Facebook link. So that's going to be a new section inside my render array. Um, I have added the actual content Facebook link under that. And I've done that for field Twitter link, field YouTube link. And so now inside this, instead of just creating a wrapper div, which currently that's all this will do, we have added these three links inside that wrapper if they exist. So uh, like he was saying, um, this is just really just more uh, dynamic. So instead of in PHP, like writing off, oh, this exists, uh, throw this HTML in, we have here, uh, it's just more dynamic, which is uh, really you want your site to be dynamic, streamlined, not printing everything on the page.
This that might sound like be a it. stupid question, but this isn't really my area per se. But what is the purpose where you have the equals and basically spitting out the same bit of code there? What what is that? Okay, so uh, so on the left side, <coughs> so you have variables content user info, which is the render array we've created here. And I am defining, I'm creating a new element per se called field Facebook link inside my render array, okay. which does absolutely nothing until I throw the actual field that has data inside it on the right side into that render array. And it may be a renderable array as well itself. And it yeah. likely is. Probably. Okay. Right? So it's just it's just this tree. Imagine a tree where you're trying to distill from the top down where you start an HTML page and everything below there is rendered programmatically by dragging down to the tree and coming back. Just like HTML is rendered. So too is the, the entire HTML tree represented. Are you a JavaScript developer at all? If you're if you're comfortable with that, then it's the concept of the DOM. I understand but it. It's the DOM it's the DOM represented in PHP array it. space. Okay. So you're kinda of doing like a field group in the pre process. Yeah, basically. Instead of just printing like every single thing individually. Um, and that is actually, yeah, it's, this is more of like a group because I created a wrapper. Um, but you could do that really for any type thing. So, any, everyone get on that? Render arrays? This is, uh, this next slide, this is what, oh gosh. You can't see that, can you? No. Uh, let's see. Dark if I thing can. kind of. <laughs> yep, that's the one. Slide I didn't change over. Okay, well, anyways, since you can't see that and it won't get bigger, um, this is Xdebug. Uh, this is the variables array. So this is basically just what the kint function that I showed earlier, that blue thing printed out on the page. This is printed out in your IDE when uh, you have a breakpoint on the page. So it's really... Uh, it's nice to not have to wait on the page for it to load and print out the blue text. Just uh, your editor will print all of this out. And um, I like Xdebug better because with Kint and Devil, a lot of times it just doesn't work. Um, especially with Drupal 8, when we started about, I think a year and a half ago, like nothing worked. So uh, uh, I, I know you know what I'm talking about. Yep. Uh, so with, with Kint, Let's see. Where is my slide? The first time you run Kent content instead of Kent content field, mm -hmm. and your entire computer just refuses to work for a few hours? Yep. Yeah, uh, also, I don't want to leave the slide. I guess I'll leave it, sure. The benefit of Xdebug here also is that when you're doing DPMs, DPRs, Kent KPRs, that kind of stuff, you have to know what you're looking for. Right, which is helpful if you know the space, but it al this allows you to see what's available in the scope of the function that you're in. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to hunt and guess four times and rerender re the page like you were saying. I mean, it's the point you're making. Yeah. Rerender that page four times till you guess the right variable that came into this function. You know what I mean? And while you're in here, you can actually, uh, if you're inside a PHP storm, you can manipulate these variables using the Drupal functions as well. So you can yeah. see what the effect of the next edit you would make to your program mm -hmm. be in real time. Yeah. Uh, I really wish you guys could see that better. Um, so here we have, this is the Kint again, um, so just FYI for anybody going to use this, never click the plus on the left side <laughs> because that will open up every single tab and it will slow down your computer for a couple minutes and then you'll end up having to close it again and you just wasted time. Um, so yeah, if you just click on the top of the tab, it opens down and click on the individual tabs, that works. Um, and another reason to use Xdebug is since this is rendered on the page, um, if you do use variables content and it's a very large page, uh, your page might not load. Uh, it might take 10, maybe not 10 minutes, five minutes to load. Um, it's just incredibly slow. Then if you use, what was that? It also breaks the layout a lot of times. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which, you know, for front end developers, Really irritating. Right. Yeah, sometimes it like the CSS won't load your JavaScript just every it looks like you're using a phone in two thousand seven to use the internet. <laughs> um so yeah, that's Xdebug. Uh someone said it the you can do uh methods and functions in the console in PHP Storm to actually so uh you guys can't see this. Uh so if I went in variables, elements, field last name. I could uh, actually type that out in PHP in the console and it would give you the value back of what that is. So you don't have to 
write out that PHP, flush your cache, reload the page, and hope that was the right field. Um, so it just makes it a lot more user friendly. It's very, uh, it's a lot easier to use. It'll make your life way easier. If you haven't already, go on my site, get the blog on how to use Xdebug because it will save your life. Do you, do you know if Xdebug works in other IDEs? It does. So uh, what do you use, Adam? Uh, Sublime or so Sublime, 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 Sublime works. Sublime works. Sublime works. So anything, I'm sorry, did it work with VS Code? Yep. I don't need any monitors. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay. pretty much. Here's the deal. It, it just communicates with PHP over a port, <coughs> so it's easy to send it something. Yeah. So it should be done. If uh, sometimes it tries to run on the same port that you use if you're using Docker or something else, so you might need to change the port yeah, number. Quick aside, if you're doing Drupal 8 work, get PHP. Not, it's like it, if you take two things away from this. Mm -hmm. Learn XD bug, get PHP from it shows you derived methods and classes from I work render really function. hard not to write anything in PHP. <laughs> 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 so I'm just saying it's it's if, if you find yourself doing this type of work with render arrays or PHP you stuff, work yeah. Five times more productive than if you have an integrated development environment that supports the, the symphony hierarchy and stuff. Alright, I'll, I'll try. Try and try. I'll try. <laughs> but but get your company to pay for the license. Yeah. <laughs> I like, let them write the PHP. So I used to blend for the last four. Nice. But if I had to do that, I could do it yeah. But that's, that's what I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. what back-end developers are for, is to do the hard stuff to do. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, uh, just a couple other things PHP Storm is great at. Uh, it indexes your whole doc, doc root. And uh, so if you're writing a module, like function, you're trying to find the hook function you need, it will show you basically every function available in an autocomplete tab. So even without going on Drupal.org to find out what function you need, it's all in there. Uh, you can also, if there's a function written down being called, you can right click and go to the declaration in Drupal core and it will show you exactly what those functions do. So uh, yeah, PHP Storm's great. So join the storm. <laughs> so. Uh, yeah. So uh, ren the render array, how that looks in Twig, um, as you saw, it was inside variables, content, user info. So you would just call content.userInfo, and that will render the wrapper divs and all of those Facebook links inside of that. Um, so another reason for render arrays is so you don't have to say content.facebook link, content.twitter link, and just write every single thing, because they're already together in a group. Another great thing about preprocess functions is theming template suggestions. As you saw earlier, there were already in the theme debug some template suggestions, but sometimes there aren't any. Sometimes it just says html.twig. Like, that's not going to help me at all. Um, so you can add a specific template naming suggestion format, or you can add, a, you can add variables to uh, go through the suggestions. Um, they can be used globally or for specific pages, and what that function looks like is its hook, so that's theme name, theme suggestions, hook, alter. Again, that second hook is the uh, theme hook that we see in the theme debug. Um, and this won't be helpful, but um, so what that outputs, instead of just variables, this function will uh, print out your hook. So this actually shows you the hook that you're using. Uh, your suggestions, so these are all the templating suggestions you would see on the page in the comments. Uh, sometimes if they don't exist, that will be an empty array. And then you have your variables here. So what some people and what some modules already do is they would say like page dash dash and then throw like a variable page title inside that. So then it, the templating suggestion would be page dash dash blogs dot html dot twig. So um, I had to do this for a search page and really I did it a terrible way. I just said if you're on slash search add search to the template suggestion because I didn't want to deal with that. Um, and I was just working on that page, so. Um, let's see, do I have an example? Yes. This is what that would look like. Function, my theme, theme suggestions. Oh, this is, uh, yeah, container, um, the container element. 
And another thing about PHP Storm is when you uh, click on an autocomplete for a function, it'll spit out the comments for you already. So then everything is documented nicely. Um, so in here, uh, I have uh, my theme, theme suggestions, hook alter, and the hook I'm using is just specifically for container elements. And uh, then you have suggestions and variables coming through that function. And a lot of people, a lot of modules, what they'll do is they'll create an array called pieces, and these are the pieces that will go in the naming structure of that suggestion. So you have the type, name, and display ID. So then what that'll look like inside suggestions, we're printing out container dash dash type dash name dash display ID. So instead of just being container.html.twig, you could have container dash full dash search dash five dot html twig so that really just gives you a lot more options for your uh, your front end people instead of having to um, just write a bunch of code like with crazy sad things like in javascript if you're on this page at this class this is very helpful for that so in twig what these things will look like uh, variables will be called by their associative key so variables footer in Twig, you would just type, you would type brackets footer. Um, that's usually not the case how modules do it. They'll throw it inside the content array. So if it's thrown inside content, it'll be, it'll look like variables content footer. And for that, you would use the dot notation. You would just say brackets content dot footer. And if you wanted to, you can use uh, if checks, different twig things for that. So for instance, if content.footer, print the content footer. It's pretty uh, standard. Those if checks kind of suck though. They, always, they, they typically are true even if there's nothing in there. Right. It's like You can if, do if renders. Yeah, if oh, really? renders, strip tags. Cool. To yeah. get it to actually give you that there's nothing there, you've mm -hmm. got to like render it and then yeah. strip out the tags and then if there's nothing. Yeah, but too much logic and it'll just flip out. <laughs> yeah, my favorite is, uh, what is it? If field name, it says, oh, well that field is there, but yep. there's nothing in it. Well, that doesn't help me. That's Thanks. kind of like that Drupal. content dot whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I use if is empty a lot. Because if it's not defined, uh, yeah. empty is true. And if it's empty, empty is true. Mm -hmm. If it's got something in it, then it works. Nice. Yeah, there's a lot. I'm sure you could even do like content dot value or whatever. Um, but uh, there's another thing I didn't add it to this slide that I have done. I've, uh, I like to add Boolean values to the variables. So for instance, that administrator check I showed earlier, you could say uh, if the user that's viewing this page is administrator, add, a, uh, add an array. So variables is admin equals true. And so you could do that. And then in your twig, you could say if is admin, render this content. So that's uh, handy, that's a very low level, just Boolean value, true or false. Um, but it is very helpful in some cases. Um, this isn't per se uh, pre-processed functions, as I was told by my coworkers when I put it in my slideshow. Um, so if you wanted to modify a form, uh, add a field, add a link to your form, uh, you would use a form alter, a hook form alter, rather than a pre-processed function. So that is that would be uh, your module name underscore form underscore alter, and inside that you would want to uh, do an if check, if form ID equals user login form, run this code. Or you can do uh, basically, I think every function, every hook function in Drupal 8 has this. You can say uh, instead of hook form alter, you can do hook form ID alter. So you can do hook user login form alter. Or um, what's another one? You can do a lot of functions are like entity types. So instead of uh, hook node alter, you could do hook entity type alter, which is the same function, but then you can throw in a custom entity you've created um, or anything else on the page. 
Um, so if you're changing forms, if you're adding uh, form elements, just be careful not to leave uh, new items vulnerable to cross-site scripting attack. There are some functions that you can use to prevent that. Um, I am not the one to ask about those. Here is uh, another, this is the form. Spits out instead of variables as we saw earlier. There's form, attributes, and then this shows these are all the fields in the form. So if we wanted to add a new field to the form, we would add it just inside that form array right there. And what that looks like, so we'd have a function, my module form alter or my theme form alter um, that includes the form, form state, and the form ID. And in this instance, I am adding a sign up link to the user login form. Uh, oh, I do have a pointer. Okay. So uh, in this instance, I'm saying if form ID is user login form, so only for this specific form, I am adding a key of sign up to the form array. And inside of that, I am adding a markup attribute, which, uh, as I said earlier, there's a page in Drupal that shows like every form element, every attribute you can use in these functions. Um, so in the markup, it allows you to print HTML. So here I've, since this is just a new link that I wanted to add to the page, I wanted to add a sign up link to the login form in case they did not have an account. So I added markup, p tag, inside of that an a tag to user register, sign up, then I set the weight to two, so then that shows up below the other fields that I have on my form. And uh, you can do that, there are a couple ways you can do that besides just doing markup. I feel like you can do a render array for that. I haven't done that, but it makes sense. So next, or uh, yeah, so today I've, we've talked about pre-processing functions, what they do, how to use them, and helpful tools and tips to make your life easier. Um, that's the end of my presentation, I guess. Um, then uh, I'm just gonna ask about tacos, see what you guys like. No, it, no, no, no. Nope. Correct. Taco Deli. Taco Deli? is the right answer. Yeah. No, I disagree. <laughs> the greatest trick the devil ever pulls by convincing people to put mashed potatoes in their tacos. Oh my gosh. Yes, I agree. Taco Deli So Taco Deli, everyone's saying that. Revolution Taco. Hey, Margaret. Let's see. I'm writing this down. We're going to agree about PHP, so we're going to agree about tacos. Yes. I like boss tacos, but they're in Round Rock, which I guess is probably a little far from my Yeah, do I? Wait, wait, wait. Foyer Lamar, you can make it back. Yeah. Oh, did I? Oh, Taco Rito on Holtzworth from the first is really good. It's your Ah, here we go. So I will go back to my title slide. Let's go back. Yeah, so I said earlier, my name's Chris. I work for code koalas in Kansas City and uh, we have a lot of we have nerf fights we have like 50 nerf guns in our office um, I have gotten shot in the eye point blank and the eye doctor said I was okay so um, we went zip lining a few weeks ago so that was fun really uh, I don't know it's great to work in a place where you can not talk to anyone because you don't want to but then also have fun with your coworkers. so um, does anybody have any questions? Yes, I do. Awesome. So, um, so, uh, full disclosure, I hate pre-process function. All right. Um, and like, not not to like uh, say that they don't do something totally useful because obviously they do. Mm -hmm. um, I guess my question is like a larger question about the API, or in this case, the lack thereof that does this for us, and mm -hmm. whether or not you feel like there's maybe a, a broader question around like, is, is there a better way to go about doing this? Hmm. Well, I do know uh, in, uh, in Drupal 8 we have, not me, uh, the people working on these things have created, instead of doing everything in a dot module file, they've done things in a more object-oriented way to do like plugins and uh, 
like source attributes, more or uh, object oriented. So maybe uh, I don't know something in that path, possibly. How do you feel about the decoupled movement? Uh, I think it's great, but that's just my personal opinion. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I started building a, a site with Vue as a front end, and uh, I think it's great. I've used the JSON API for that. Um, some people use the GraphQL. It's really great. Um, but really, all that's going to be doing is you have your front end, and then you're still getting all your content that you're getting from JSON API, whatever. We'll still probably be in the way in variables. Preprocessing may still be there. Um, there might be a different way for that as uh, you're using JSON API to output those rather than Drupal core. Um, so that might change how things are pre-processed. Uh, but I think it's great. It's really you just use your selected choice of front end, React, View, and then you grab the content. And then you do whatever you want with it. The, the real problem, we've been building a couple of different sites for I don't know, we've been awesome places in five some years now. And the real problem is that find yourself reinventing form validation, user authentication. Yeah. You're going through a lot of them. A lot of the benefits that you get out of this plan. It's not to say it's not worth it. We have, right? we have a that's why we start with a, a default theme. We have a, a platform agnostic theme that we start with that uses NPM to do a lot of those things. And, and th I guess that's kind of my point is that what you begin to find very quickly is that PHP is not the appropriate stack to be building the system on top of yeah. It's not, it's not, you can't, you can't do your stuff. Even FPM, you use FPM for like that trust bank on the backside, it's, it doesn't hold a candle to things that you scratch with. So it's a slippery slope. We started doing that and we found ourselves kind of abandoning Drupal as a kind of management system for some this stuff, but then came crawling back in some ways for <coughs> So it's, we swung out on that pendulum and then we came over like, all right, we kind of came back to crawl a little bit or something. Yeah, th this is like a conversation we yeah. had internally uh, <laughs> at Aquia and within the community at large. And my constant question is, so you want to reinvent all of Form API and the Yield API? You and don't. Like and you've done it. Right. It's a pain, it's a pain in the No, nobody yeah. wants to do that, right? <laughs> but, but, but everybody who's doing it, I'm like, I'm like so. Well, so, you know, the, we, have, we have a couple of projects that are coming in that are really interesting where they're looking to do some of the ITB edit, uh, edit in place kind of stuff, mm -hmm. uh, inline editors, right. um, and some of the systems that use that. I think we can make those a bit more robust and a bit more scalable so that we could adjust them to the way we need them to work while still letting Drupal do a lot of the heavy listing and form validations because yeah. they share enough commonalities. Um, but I think, I think it's a real problem, especially as you come to our customers, that Drupal's in a weird place where it's a content management system which if you reach kind of back in the history of Drupal, you realize it means that your, your data should be structured, right? Mm -hmm. In a way that is composable and reusable across views and all these other things that you're gonna list out. A lot of the sites that get enlisted, that Drupal gets enlisted for, properly or not, are page management systems. Mm -hmm. And somebody can speak about page management systems, right? Mm -hmm. But the, kind of the question really here is, how do we tie these two ends together? Because a lot of our right. sites have enough dynamic data that people need to make, like, lots of projects that they want to highlight, or these things, and then enough pages that they want to make that are unique snowflakes that have to be treated separately. And to merge those two concepts together is really where the kind of the struggle sits. Mm -hmm. Where when a customer comes to a page, they just want to edit that page as it sits there. And they don't really care that this content happens to come from this project over here, and then you got to go over there to edit that. Nobody, nobody cares. Mm -hmm. So it's finding the balance between those two things that, yeah. that we're currently struggling with. And I know that's good. Yeah. This is your point. But yeah, well, and I mean, like, and core is moving so heavily, like in so many directions at once. You know, we've got like constant moderation stuff going on, and we've got like quick edit going on, we've got layout builder going on. And I'm like, you realize quick edit doesn't know squat about revisions. So when you make oh, yeah. revisions, right. like have the fun with that. Yeah. You know, and they're just they're like a lot of moving parts there. You can't have all of these pieces. Realistically, you, have realistically you have to choose. And that's, in my opinion, I've been against the monolithic growing of core as a result because we need a strong foundation to build these things on top of with different ecosystems. Because, because we can't we can even support four diverging paths for what a kind of energy system should be. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. I mean, Is that good? No. <laughs> I mean, I don't do it anymore. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, well, I mean, like, I was a, a lot of, wow, those are interesting words. Um, I was a very big small core proponent back in the day, but here we are building it 
bigger, bigger board, bigger board. Yeah. and and like I'm not necessarily against it with the way that we're doing, but we do have to have like a greater degree of uh, <coughs> like discussion about how these things integrate together. And like the sad reality is that we can't do that outside of court. Experiment. Oh, I don't. Well, I mean, I like years worth of trying. I want to have this conversation, but I guess the point is. Um, experimental module status and these type of things are allowing people to throw caution to the wind and, and get them kind of mainlined in, which is good for innovation, but it lacks the cohesive approach yeah, that's needed yeah, across all of these spaces. You know what I mean? Because they're right, quick edit has no idea about the original system and there's yeah, no and unfortunately it's not experimental. Yeah, yeah, there's no UX there's no UX to fix that either. Like there's no UX system that I can think of that really makes this work. If it is there, it even gets more complicated. You know what I mean? So I don't it, I don't know. Long story yeah. short. I think we need a solid foundation uh, mm -hmm. that does this. That we can then start adding things on top of to where we realize that we're the ones who are making the that's the key to <laughs> the developer should be the one making the decision to which system you're embracing, as opposed to assuming that somebody else has thought this through. Right. Because the honest right. is no bad. Yeah. <laughs> I want to talk to you about something. I, mean, I know that this is, has nothing to do with no, anything, so I'm going to. But I, I wonder how, how Drupal developers feel about the idea of going in and sort of customizing your Drupal installation. Um, if you, for example, if you're going to download Angular to use on the front end of a, of a site, you can go through and in that core install, you can choose the things that you want, choose the things that you don't want to include. You can pull the whole thing down whole hog, or you can just pick and choose the bits and pieces that you want and just use that. The, the framework that this is built on top of, right, is pluggable in a way that allows you to do that elegantly as opposed to brutally by removing code. So I'd argue that you want to use the correct dependency injections and, and the correct, I don't know what your particular example is, but you can override entire swaths of the system on the fly in a way that allows you to maintain the ability to upgrade. And I would suggest that that's the path you want to go. It takes, it takes a little bit more understanding in terms of like how the system actually works, but then you're not doing the same thing where you're trying to hack and do parse string parsing on HTML. Right. You know what I mean? You dig a little bit deeper and you can surgically extract the tumor that you have. <laughs> yeah, but the question she's asking is the very question that like DevSeed asked back during the Drupal 6 cycle of, and why small core was ever even like a discussion. And I mean, I still think that we're not there yet, <laughs> but we started using Composer to actually document the individual components of Drupal yes. Core at this point. So you could theoretically, yeah, I Composable. I yeah. completely agree. I mean, I think that's, I think that's the key is that you have a small core that is composable. You can call the whole thing core. It doesn't matter what you call it. They need right. to be composable objects. Like, yeah, they need to be composable objects so you can pick and choose the pieces that you want. But I mean, the simple yes. fact of the matter is, is like. You can't say, oh, I want to use Drupal's entity system and not get 90% of Drupal, right? <laughs> like, it's just going to happen. Well, I just, like, it, you know, the, the one thing that amazes me is views. We don't use views, but just because of the way that we deal with the front end, we, we use views almost never on these sites. But it's in co it's core in 8 now, so you have to bring it down, and it's huge. Well, and well, nobody cares about the size, to be honest. Yep. For, for, Frank, frankly, all our dependencies outstrip the size of Drupal. Yeah, that, that doesn't matter at all. Um, so the size of these things is, in, I don't mind that, but it, it's an irrelevant topic for discussion as it relates to how this stuff comes together. But I mean, it's you know, but I mean, you see what I'm saying. If, why should I have to have views if I'm never going to use? Views? Oh, just turn the module off and call it a day. The code won't run. That's right. it. That's, that's the honest truth. Yep. Yeah. That, that's what you're really trying to avoid. So I think yep. the, I know what you're talking about are totally legitimate concerns, like the overhead of actually managing those functions. If you disable that module, we catch that concept, and we don't then go crawl through and look for all the files and down there. So like what you're talking about is totally legit. Like the systems are in place to make it for that part. Cool. Yeah. Part grows are cheap. Yeah, yeah. The, the amount of just space that takes is, is we'll look your, the amount we'll of brain render. space it would take. <laughs> we'll look at your render right. folder and do, do that stuff. Right. <laughs> well, you know, I, I say this knowing full well that you know our npm packages folders are exactly. Yeah. Not, they're, now they're exactly. flattened. Now they're flattened and they're actually being done well with those some of the yarn. You yeah. know what I mean? So. I'm just trying to understand. I'm, like I said, I'm not a Drupal developer, but I'm trying to yeah. at least understand the system on which I'm building. And I think that this is a good point. And I'd, I'd like to hear what you think about this as well. But with the things that you brought up here mm -hmm. were excellent with like regards to how these arrays work. But if you understand a little bit of the history behind 
it, you begin to understand some of the complexity. Right. Because we've been down the path where this, we've been down the simple path. And we tried to outsmart our ways out of some of the complexities that we run into, where we were parsing HTML in PHP, trying to figure out what we were doing to extract the right bits. So we come up with a random API, and we're like, this solves everything. And then we take that too far, and it's like, oh, wait, we messed this up. Yeah. You know? well, well, the biggest issue with, like, in my opinion, the biggest issue with um, form API and thus render API, because render API was essentially built on subsequent form API and copied it, is that everything's declarative. If you want to do anything, you have to know what all the strings are to get it done. Mm. There's no, like, like you can't use PHP Storm and be like, what methods do I have? Yeah. Oh, maybe that's the thing. What parameters do you think? Yeah, this is what I want. Like, no, you have to know. And so that is still a page literally the three of us are yes. on yesterday in the render render rail. Yeah, it's right. like yeah. I'm going down into it. What yeah. do you need to use? So you have to dig through through the, the Drupal documentation, which is this enormous page, one for forms and one for render arrays in general. And it's just like like unless you know everything, you're gonna just get your head against the wall. Right. Yeah. I feel like you guys kind of deserve that though, because I don't know if you've ever looked at Of course at you do it, they got we understand it. I don't know if you've ever looked at the DOM for, for a Drupal page, but it's divs inside divs inside divs. Can, 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 I, can I tell you why it's like that? It's like that because of the, the statement that you made earlier. No, no. It's like that because of the statement you said earlier where you said it's somebody else's problem. Because the developer looks at that and goes, the information's on the page that needs to be here. And the front end person looks at the page and goes, I can style it however I want. I don't need to do the back end. But the truth is that both of you need to get a lot deeper into each other's space. Right, that's why because, I'm here. because we have the tools. A good, a good Drupal developer will give you the structured semantic HTML that you need to make this page right. nothing more, yeah. depending on the budget of the project and their ability to do it. But the truth is that you have people who don't care or don't understand what you Yeah, do. or they don't and ask. And you don't have the other mm. knowledge as well. So I think, I think that's actually the problem, is that this isn't that complicated. And if you dug into it, you'd see how empowered you could be for creating the markup that you need coming out of the system. Yeah, yeah. See, I the, most of the stuff that I do on the back end, I can I can integrate components into Drupal templates using the Twig and yeah. you know kind of that. But the pre-processed stuff, it's always been a little beyond me, and you know because that's that's what I have back end developers for. Yeah. But I'm beginning to realize that I should probably stop. I should probably stop doing that. <laughs> 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 I think that's 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 you have to make sure that your communication. I think what what you're saying is absolutely right. It's just about it's it's merging. You're a team, you know, with your developers. Mm -hmm. You guys need to interface and communicate constantly. And if they don't care about semantic structure or adding infinite number of divs to your page, well, let's have a chat. Yes. Why? Why? <laughs> this is why I think it's important to list, you know, from even from a developer's brain, they can certainly understand about load times and, and being able to read through uh, being blind. If I can real quick, those divs are there because you ask for them in the same way that your designer or your front end person asked mm -hmm. for, can I have this class, this class, this class? So as developers, three cycles ago, we said, what class is there? <laughs> these, these these assholes get everything they want. And, and, and the truth is, is that the truth is, is that no, the truth is, is that you can theme this div soup mess into mm -hmm. exactly what you want. But you have Pressure. to find your way through it. But but the thing is, is that sometimes it's like a UX uh, front end developer, the CSS declarations I have to write to style those make me cry. Yeah. <laughs> and it's time to first time last time plus line minus four. You can. That's the truth. And I'm not arguing against that 100. No, I'm just saying. From yeah. this. Like I know why this was done, but I still need a box of cleaning. Well, this is like old school CSS and Zengarten, right? I mean, it's like, hey, we stuck enough classes, and CSS is powerful enough that you can style this however you want. But the chains are just make you cry. The chains are just make you cry. Yeah, it's only it's only a trick. I say it's mostly there because you're using yeah. you're using generic HTML and CSS is being rendered by a system that has to appeal to the lowest common denominator. Yeah. Okay, but if you have a good Drupal developer who's pushing that output to you, all of that should be pulled from the system. Right. The, the default view classes that come out on views for even odd, the, the records that go around all these different fields, all of these things should be culled from the system so that what you get some well, and and those have been in eight, like yeah, even odd has been in eight. Yeah. You have to use it as a child now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, 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 outside of, and there's been outside of, of, on the other side of the coin, even outside of Drupal, as a, as a um, front end coder, as a front end developer, we also, you can structure your data and your CSS hooks to logically be needed and it can do everything you want 
without having to add 16 different CSS classes. That's true. Yeah. That's our responsibility. And not to malign like my teammate, but there's been a number of times where I've been told, well, you could just do it as an inline CSS thing. Mm -hmm. It's like, no, yes, no, yes, no. Yes, no. So, like, well, it totally, I yeah. understand what you're saying. It's the quality like, of. We can't fix that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's it's pre-processor, but it's pre-processor the place to strip out some of that extra. Yeah. Yes and no. Yes and no. So, so, that's, that's, the, the, yeah. <laughs> so that's my question to begin with, right? Because I've spent the last six years now working to get like a layout.